Interestingly, while on the internet preparing for my message this afternoon, I stumbled across a definition for sermon. I says, oh, and it was defined as a talk on a religious or moral subject, usually based on passages from the Bible. I says, you know, that's, that's right, that's good, so far. But then it went on to say something else. It says, a long or tedious admonition or reproof. I says, oh boy, I didn't think I liked the way that sounded. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just give a homily. Now, for some of you old Catholics, you may know what a homily is. Others may not, but it's not for me to explain that. So I looked up the word homily on the internet myself. Well, believe it or not, I didn't like the definition of that one either. <laughs> the definition there described it as a religious discourse intended for spiritual edification. Fantastic. I thought that was great. All went well and good. But then it went on to describe it as a tedious moralizing discord. Now, there's that word tedious again. I says, boy, oh, boy. You know, I didn't feel particularly inclined taking part in either one of those two messages today. So I thought, well, maybe today, the, here it is, the weekend of the 4th of July, when thoughts of our country, of course, and its history are particularly on our minds this weekend. What a better time to, of course, make some observations regarding our nation's spiritual background and ponder on how it might affect us today. You know, living in a time when issues of war, politics, religious discourse, along with moral opinions that divided a country, you know, you stop and think. It wasn't much different in 1776 as it is today because those are the same issues that we're talking about. But talking about patriotism and love of country while implying a relationship with God may seem imprudent to undertake at this time. But you know what? Too many Americans today, just speaking the name of our country and God in the same sentence seems to some reason or another be offensive to them. You know. This seems especially true in that, little in that little phrase that we say in the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. Or when we look at the motto inscribed on our money and we see, in God we trust. So as we look to this upcoming celebration of the 4th of July, marking the 246th year of our independence as a nation, I wonder, you know, can we really be patriotic and profess our Christianity at the same time? Can God and Christian living really be a part of the fabric of today's governance and our political life? You know, one of the axioms you may hear every so often from CEOs and even from some high-ranking coaches in the sports industry when your company or your team doesn't seem to have a clear directive or even a winning strategy, you might hear something like this. It's time that we go back to basics. So let's take a page from that wise playbook and regain that little bit of insight. Let's go back a little bit to basics just for a few moments. Now with that idea in mind, I thought it might be interesting as we celebrate this 246th year on the 4th of July, 2022, to see what we could find in God, uh, about God in our Declaration of Independence of 1776. To do, to do that, of course, I'll be reading some passages out of the Declaration and reflecting on its meanings. Now, one writer I found claims that the 56 signers, that 52 of them, were orthodox practicing Christians, and that every one of them looked to the Bible for the truth and knowledge about a divine creator whom they felt influenced American destiny. Now there's a test, and there was also the testimony of Patrick Henry, you know, the guy that spoke those words in the speech in 1775, give me liberty or give me death. But maybe you didn't know in 1776, he also wrote, 
It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was not founded by religionists, but by Christians. That's to say, brethren, that this nation was founded not by people who just went around protesting or professing their religious zeal with excessive enthusiasm like you see some people today, but by men and women who actually practice their faith on a day-to-day, day-in, day-out basis. And just as a side note, maybe to add a little context to, this, to, the spe- to the sermon today, I'll bet most of you didn't know this, that it was Congress, Congress itself, that formed the American Bible Society. And that one of the first acts that that first Congress did was it purchased 20,000 copies of the Bible for its new citizens and its new nation. Now, on the other hand, one misguided public servant that we recently had recently called, declared that this, that this country, this America, is not a Christian nation. While that may be offensive to many of us today, it is probably closer to the truth today than it was in 1776, a time when our nation's founders and leaders expressed their Christian faith without hesitation, as seen in their writings and in their everyday life. You know, the beauty and the splendor of this document is that first it's shrouded by its simplicity and its straightforward approach to its theme. There's nothing extraneous, there's no stirring rhetoric, and there's totally no ideology involved in it. And yet to this day, it still shines as a model for political theory. It is a ringing testimony against tyranny. And it's also a wilderness cry to all of us to be on guard of those who argue that the name of God should be deleted from our public squares, our schools, and most importantly, banned from the halls of those who govern us. Is it too late? I don't know. They're already doing that, aren't they? It starts off when the In the course and when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. It goes on to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these, of course, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted by men and among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of those who are to be governed. Now, the case of independence, let's face it, brethren, it wasn't based on military calculations. If that was the case, we would have never started this war because you're fighting against the the most powerful uh, army in the world. It wasn't set on economics. We had a new country. They had no money. Nor was it as part of consideration or personal preferences. It is based on self-evident truths concerning the nature and the rights of men as given by their creator, brethren. Now, sorry to all those secularists out there may hear this, but yes, We're talking about God here. The God who determined that there were certain natural rights that have been given to each and every person, each and every human being, brethren. And it is those rights that that they were seeking to have restored to them and to us after they had been denied by some monarch or some government body of men as we even see today in our own government. The signers were looking to God, whom they referred to as the supreme judge of the world, for their moral stamp of approval. Listen to their words themselves. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, 
in general Congress assembled and appealing to the supreme judge of the world. Right there in the Constitution. For the restitute of our intentions, do solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and by right, ought to be free and independent states. Such simplicity and succinctness in the political doctrine is only possible, brethren, when a nation's fundamental principles are firmly and universally understood by all and can be simply stated as established by God. Today, mutual understanding or principles seem to be shifting underneath us all, both at home and, of course, on the global scene. Thousand-page complex documents, if you think about it, have been enacted here in the U.S. and abroad out of necessity because we find ourselves unable to agree on definition of terms of moral justification. Not only that, but it's a term of what is a woman or what is a man. It's been so complicated that we have to have hundreds of pages for that definition to even be posted. Gridlocks in our own legislative bodies demonstrate the consequences of basic morality, brethren. Today, government bodies find it impossible to, degree, to agree what? On almost anything, especially when it comes to basic human rights. Why? Why is that? Because they have stripped their political language of all relationship to God and natural law. They no longer have universal reference points for right or wrong. The results? We all suffer. How can anyone, in my opinion, question that this nation was not founded on, a, on the Christian principles by the men and women whose religious convictions were an inherent part of their daily thinking and living? Let me be very clear about the people of this nation and how they saw themselves in the world of 1776. The vital and intricate part or framework around which this document was started, it all, it started all and justified this nation's existence to start with. They were based on a belief of a supreme creator and its Christian, Christian principles. Now, what I like to do at this time, and this is where Paul was supposed to fill in all these other holes, <laughs> but what I want to do this time is I want to bring you into this picture and show you how we have declared our spiritual declaration of independence. I quote a statement here, from, or I quote a sentence from the declaration itself. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Sadly today, brethren, we hear by some of our political leaders and even in our educational institutions that our forefathers wanted God out of the framework of this great country. You know what? They obviously skipped over reading this document that they all swore an allegiance to uphold. And of course, we know that our forefathers did not want any type of state religion. But how some can conclude that they wanted God totally and completely out of the picture in starting this nation, I'll never understand that one. Today, you know what? This, this declaration more or less seems benign. I know it's not being taught in our history classes anymore. If you go out on the street, you'll ask, you'll ask people, what's the Declaration of Independence? What are the Bill of Rights? They have no idea what you're even talking about. It was even asked, I remember watching on television one time, it was asked, who did we fight in the Revolutionary War? I think one out of ten actually knew who we fought, let alone asking them what year we fought it. That, that, was, that, that one took me even for, for more of a joke. It was anywhere from 1930 to 1980 that we fought the Revolutionary War. But let me tell you something, brethren. 
Let me assure you that these 56 signers, it did more than raise their eyebrows. One third of these signers lost everything that they had ever worked for. Nine fought and died from the wounds of hardships from the war itself. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. So why? Why were these men so willing to risk everything, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, when they could have lived in peace and comfort? So why did they do that? Because they all believed freedom, brethren, was infinitely more desirable than bondage. They believed freedom was worth fighting for. And they knew freedom was not free and never has been. They joined the fight for freedom by risking everything they had. Today, we call it skin in the game. When we have skin in the game, we're more careful about our decisions, aren't we? Skin in the game is putting your money where your mouth is. It's not an audacious promise, but a calculated action in which there is plenty of risk. But the, re the rewards are tremendous. So what about us? Do we have skin in the game? Are you willing to risk everything that you have for your faith and your belief in your God? You know, as the colonists opposed the King of England 246 years ago for this great country's freedom, Jesus Christ, brethren, defeated Satan for our eternal freedom. Every one of us that accepts Christ accepts his proclamation. We sign a spiritual declaration of independence, declaring war on the enemy of our eternal spiritual life. If you're looking for a title, I've entitled this message today, Our Spiritual Declaration of Independence. Our Spiritual Declaration of Independence. And what I'd like to do now is present just two points. There are many, many points that we could bring up. But I didn't realize I was going to be the only speaker today. Otherwise, I would have had ten points. But today, you're only going to get two. Two points to define what this declaration means to us and all Christians today. Point number one, our conversion is a declaration of war. Our Christian conversion is a declaration of war. There is no place for spiritual pacifism, believe it or not, in a Christian's life. You and I, brethren, we are at war against Satan. If we fail to engage this enemy, or we even underestimate him, he will and can defeat us. Our war is not just of defense, but a very, very strong offense as well. Just as the colonists had a strong leader in George Washington, we have a proven leader, brethren, in Jesus Christ. He has the weapons and the plan for complete and total victory. You know, you'll see a lot of times that people have all this energy and want to do things, but they have no plan. How do you get there? They have no idea. They just let the wind blow them. Brethren, in our Declaration of Independence, there is a plan, and it's led by a leader that has proven himself. We know that freedom, brethren, is not is physically or spiritually, it is not free. We must take up spiritual arms and claim the freedoms that we have been promised. And we all know that's not going to be an easy task. War is never easy. Let's turn to Matthew 10, brethren. Matthew 10. Just to show you that we were never promised a perfect or a peaceful life, were we? We were promised quite the opposite. Let's see what Christ said that he was going to be bringing in Matthew 10. Matthew 10, we're going to start in verse 34. Verses 34 through 36. He tells us, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. 
I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And verse 36, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. Now, we all know how that scenario plays out, don't we, brethren? You know, God opens your mind. You accept his terms as he defines them. You keep his Sabbath day, his holy days, and his commandments. And because of these truths, brethren, the persecutions begin. Even for members of our own family. Even for members who have been in God's church that leave. Persecutions still follow. Why is that? Simply because God's truth, brethren, has been given to you to understand. And Satan will use all and any means to destroy that truth, even from within our own families and with our own loved ones. In 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 10, brethren, Paul tells us about this war, who we're fighting, what weapons we need, and what is required for us to bring into captivity total victory. In 2 Corinthians 10, we'll read verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought, brethren, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Brethren, this is a battle for our very minds, the very things that we think about. And as a direct result, it's a battle for our spiritual lives. This war is between what this world has been deceived to be as truth or perceived as truth to what God actually tells us is truth. And it truly boggles my mind to see how man's secular thoughts differ from God's way of thinking. You don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, in verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, how many times have you thought, God, why did you do it that way? should have did it this way. It would have worked out better for me. But his thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when you think you've got a good plan over and above what God's thinking, go back to Isaiah 55. Read that a few times. Let me give you some additional examples of what I mean by this. Now, it's normally, it's perfectly normal uh, for Christians, all of us, to think that we should attend church, right? The Bible teaches it. Yet many non-believers, and believe it or not, some that claim to be believers, classify fundamental churchgoers, church-going people, as intolerant, homophobic, bigots, and in some cases, even a menace to society. I've heard that a couple of times. Now, how do you figure that one out? I have no idea. But that's how some of them think. Another reason or another way is Christians believe that human life is created in God's image and is sacred, isn't it? We believe in the sanctity of human life. And we do not condone the indiscriminate aborting of unborn babies, do we? But to the world... Hey, abortion is just a choice, just another form of birth control. And you can see this on television now every day since Roe vs. Wade. Unbelievable how people still think that it's been done away with. Instead of now, don't you realize you have the power? Back to where you started in the Constitution. One more reason or one more point here is we believe in morality revealed in the Ten Commandments, don't we? On the other hand, the world writes its laws in the sand. 
and it's willing to change whenever the tides change itself. Is this war now becoming clearer to you? Maybe your eyebrows are lifting just a little bit more, saying, whoa, maybe you ought to look at this a little more seriously. Brethren, we must never, never forget to uphold the standards that are set forth by God's word in his book that I now have been calling our spiritual declaration of independence. Because it's through that book that you'll have the plan for victory. Point number two. Our conversion is a declaration of separation. We had a declaration of war. Now we have a declaration of separation. In the Declaration of Independence, the colonists made it clear that they would not be tied to Britain in any way, shape, or form. The document reads, and I quote, We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world. They wanted God out of the picture? Uh, The supreme judge of the world, for the restitute of our intentions due in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Our forefathers knew, brethren, that we could not be free and remain colonies of the British Empire. They declared their sovereignty, and they fought until they had won total and complete separation. When we were baptized, brethren, we accepted Christ. We signed that spiritual document that we would break from everything that God rejects and would be willing to fight to resist Satan and all of his false values. How are we doing on that? I know occasionally we get captured, don't we? We get tortured a little bit. We spill our beans, you know. We give up. But then God comes back in and says, he rescues us. He says, we have another war to fight. Take up your arms. In Galatians 5, brethren, in Galatians 5, in first verse, one verse, here Paul speaks of our Christian liberty. He says in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then if you drop to verse 13, he goes on to say, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what are some of the ways here? What are some of the ways that we can stand fast against this yoke of bondage? Now, there's no surprises here. What I'm going to mention here is about three of them, but you'll probably have a hundred more that we can use as the same, our same uh, uh, freedom to stay off of this yoke of bondage. One, I think Jim brought this up not too long ago. Pray. <laughs> Pray, that's a simple enough one. That's one of the strongest armaments that we have in our arsenal. Pray daily. Christ said to pray, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from all evil and from the evil one. Two, study and rehearse your declaration of independence daily so that you totally understand your plan for victory. How many times I remember when I was in the service myself and we went on different routines that we went over and over and over again on the plan that we have to follow. And if you don't rehearse it, brethren, you'll forget it. You won't know that road to victory. So study that word. Understand it. 
Let it seep into every part of your being, your body, your soul, your mind, so that when confronted by the enemy, you have the weapons to defend yourself. And three, most importantly, invite the living presence of God to envelop you and empower you so that you can draw from that arsenal that God presents to us. You know, we even talk about it in our, our hymnals, don't we? You know, on page 170, it says, Fight the good fight, brethren. And that's taken from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, in Revelations 3, in Revelations 3, we need to heed Christ's warning to be on guard. In Revelations 3, verses 14 through 16, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, Amen, I'm sorry, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. And in verse 16, so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Our job, brethren, is to be as much of a warrior as we can in following Jesus Christ. Not to become Laodicean, but to remain steadfast and to complete our life's mission. And that's from the very beginning. A lot of people in their life, their mission is hard work, get married, have children, die. Nothing else. Our mission is different, brethren. And we know what it is. We have the plan. We need to follow it. You know, one of the greatest threats to our spiritual victory is to be lethargic. And we all get there. We all are lethargic at times. And we do nothing to resist evil. It's so easy sometimes to capture us and to fill us with junk and garbage, television every day, friends that we used to have maybe, and just the world itself. I'm in it every day. And I can't wait to get out. <laughs> Each one of us, brethren, must stand up and join the army of God. That way, we're moving forward under the direction of God's anointing spirit. And at that time, we can pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The time is now, brethren, the time is now to make our conversion a living declaration of war and of separation against Satan and anything that stands in our way for complete and total victory. As our forefathers had the courage, brethren, and the vision to set a path for a new and great nation for those, of course, that would follow, let us now have the courage and the vision to follow the path paved by God to a new and great kingdom that will last forever with liberty and justice for all. I'd just like to close with a little poem that I found. It's not really a poem. It's just kind of a, a saying to close to where I think God is striving to take all of us. This is a story about an eagle that was captured at a very young age. Its captor held it in bondage so it couldn't fly. But he let it roam the barnyard. It wasn't long before this eagle began acting like one of the chickens. Scratching and pecking at the ground for its very existence. Now this great and magnificent bird that once soared the heavenly skies was, was satisfied to act like a chicken. Now one day, a shepherd came to the farm. Now he seen the eagle, and he said, what a shame to keep this magnificent bird hobbled here in the barnyard. Won't you please set it free, he asked the owner. The captor agreed, 
and he cut off its restraints. So used, though, that the routine that this eagle continued to wander the barnyard, scratching and pecking for its existence. Now the shepherd, knowing its potential, set this magnificent bird on a high perch. And for the first time since its captivity, the eagle saw the expanse of the great horizon and the brilliant skies. And as it spread its wings, a miraculous and a tremendous wind lifted into the heavens. And it once again became the eagle it was created to be. Brethren, if you're going to be free to soar and be all which God has created you for, Break from the barnyard mentality. We have to come out of her, come out of the midst and be totally separate and declare your spiritual declaration of independence. Have a safe, enjoyable, and meaningful Independence Day, brethren.